the future incorporated the purpose of that organization is to um, provide education for children about the beauty and wonder of nature through active engagement and they have programs for children <coughs> K through 8th grade through, and they have structured and non-structured learning activities that include exploration and discovery so she's um, she has a BS in botany and a master's degree in forestry from Purdue, and today she's going to tell you more about that organization and its purpose. Thank you. If you don't mind, I think I'm going to stand in front of the podium. You can see Ashley see me. <laughs> As Diane said, I'm Zonda Bryant, uh, director of Pants of the Future, and yes. oh, so you guys can hear me. Okay. okay. So I'm the director of Hands of the Future, and six or seven years ago, I've I've been working with children probably for 45 years since I was a teenager in various forms, and I got science degrees because I love to discover the world around me, especially in the life sciences. So that's why I have the botany and the forestry degrees. But um, six years ago, I began to really notice about how disconnected this generation of children are from the natural world. And after reaching, reading Richard Lube's book, Last Child in the Woods, I thought, this is my community. I need to see what I can do about it. These are my children and our, my neighbor's children. So I started a, a group called um, Hands of the Future. The very first year, we started Junior Nature Club. This is held out at Celery Bog. We started with 12 children from Happy Hollow Elementary, 5th and 6th grade. And we found out that they, they came faithfully. They loved what we were doing. They were excited about it. We thought, well, if this is working for them, we need to invite more children. So the second semester, we added the county kids for Tippecanoe School Corporation. And we went to 24. This is some of the ex... Is there a pointer on this? No. no. Oh, okay. Well, anyway... I'll go over here. I think the kids accept me. The kids accept me because I kind of blend in. <laughs> anyway, we were learning about uh, how different birds' beaks, uh, how they feed. This was for hummingbirds. We were talking about how birds build nests. We were building squirrel feeders. I'm not sure what we were learning about there. We had a guest speaker, several amphibians, reptiles. Inside this bucket is a mud puppy. I had never seen a mud puppy before, and they got to touch them. He has a frog on his arm. In the middle of this circle is a turtle that they're all fascinated with. We went tracking in the snow. And this was in the spring. This is what the mussel tree, I think Sam has named that the mussel tree. That's what the kids call it. So they were excited in that, and it was pretty muddy that day, and they found a geocache inside of there, and over here there was a tree stump, they found a dead baby possum, I think is what we decided it was, and this was at the end of the spring. Well, we were pretty impressed with the kids' response to what we were doing. So the next year, we decided to invite all the school corporations, we added fourth grade, so now we go to fourth to sixth, and we had 78 children enroll in our programs that year, 35 of them that came consistently to every meeting. This was the first meeting of the year. There was 55 children at this meeting. We played a game so they could learn about raptors. I talked to them in the beginning. Carol Blackader at the Wildlife <laughs> Center, the Rescue Center, she came and presented uh, her owl, and she released a green egret. They were enthralled. I, I love her face right here because she was just, she was so excited. We learned about the changing of the seasons. They're learning to identify the different leaves. We went out and collected leaves and, and explored the woods and to see what we could see that was changing. Now this has become an annual event. This is uh, the Wild Man of Alders game from Joseph Cornell, who's been an expert in children and nature since the 70s. And so we played the wild man walking softly. And the saying goes, there are wild men out there sleeping. 
Walk softly so you don't wake them. For if you do, they will surely chase you, and all you can do is run. <laughs> so <laughs> if you make it to the safe spot, good for you. If you don't, you will have to give him one of your magic golden beans. He says you only have five, so walk softly. And those are the magic beans. We took grandma beans and spray painted them gold. Give each child five. We were giving them instructions. We had forestry guys that decorated themselves in camouflage and hid in the woods. And uh, the thing, maybe these guys are waiting their turn to go. So the problem is it's fall. So you have crunching leaves. And so they cannot be quiet. And, and so they go down, and you'll see one child, and they're going closely, being very careful. And all of a sudden, this, this being drops, jumps up out of, the, out of the dark and starts chasing them. And they scream, and they run. And the rest of the kids are going, run, run! And so they get all excited. And they said, even though I was scared to death, it was so fun. We want to do it again and again. So, so this has become an annual event. We had a feast for all. We uh, played the game Noses, and then we made bird feeder suet. We actually rendered beef that year. We have not done it that way since. It smells so bad. These girls up here, they don't want to smell it. It smells really bad. Uh, most of the kids got into it after a while, but there was two boys that would have nothing to do with it. They didn't want to touch it. They didn't want to take it home. So we thought, okay, well, you don't have to. And then we learned about the different, the food chain and pesticides and what happens as you go up the chain to the top predators. <coughs> Our furry friends, we had Carol come back with some of her um, rep, um, mammals. There's a uh, Pockets, the, the uh, possum, and she has a uh, flying squirrel. We learned about the web of life and how we're all interconnected. This is, I think it's important for the kids to learn that we are all part of nature and that we all have influence over everything around us and that's one of the ways to show them. Water, water everywhere. We learned about how much of the globe is actually in water. We played the water cycle game where they were actually molecules going around the different places. It's a random dice game. Then we learned, uh, we did an experiment to call the drop in the bucket. And you start with a liter of water and you do all these steps, measuring it out to see how much is in the groundwater, how much is frozen. And by the time you get down to what's drinkable, you have one drop in the Petri dish. So that, that, takes them, that makes them understand how we have to conserve water. Then we did dirty, isn't it? And we were learning about soil. Uh, Rick Parsons came, he's a, a retired science teacher. And they loved him. If he had turned around, he'd have bopped somebody. They were so close. But he had some experiments for them to do. They talked about what lives in the soil and about the different soils. And then they planted seeds for things to plant in the woods. This was actually out at a place called Berlowitz Woods out by the Arnett Hospital. We at one time thought that we were going to be able to build a children's forest out there. But that fell through with the city. So um, they planted trees out there. They, they were able to select whatever trees they wanted, and they went out in the woods and they planted them. And then we were listening to the heartbeat of the tree to see how the, the flow of the sap was. And I always make treats, so down here are lorex and trees with the... the anyway, they, they like that part. Color the world happy. We were back out at Berlowitz and we were planting. All those seeds we started were wildflowers for the understory, and we were planting those. Some of the kids really liked that. There was one little boy, we were supposed to go salamander, salamander hunting, and he says, wait, wait, one more, one more, and he planted two more flowers because that's what he liked to do, and we waited on him. <laughs> we went salamander hunting, hunting. Uh, my assistant, Bora, taught that one, and we were looking underneath logs, underneath mm -hmm. the plates she had, and we, in the end, we had to use the two that I have as pets, the tiger salamanders, because we couldn't find any, and so they got to all hold those. And this is the thing that we do on the year. It's a treasure hunt, and that has also become an annual event. Oops. I don't know what that is. So we break them up into small groups. One adult goes with each group, but we just kind of follow along. And we hide seven pouches out in the woods. We give them a map, a compass, and clues. And they're usually riddles. And they have to find the seven treasures. So they're trying to figure out where to go next, and they're having fun along the way. And somebody was smart enough to see the two moths, the cecropia moths, 
So they got a picture of that. Well, so the next year we thought, this is really working. We need to increase what we're doing. And the parents kept asking us, we wished you had stuff for the little kids because the siblings would come and they wouldn't be able to participate. So this year we got a grant from the Whistler Foundation for 30000 and we added second to fourth grades as well as the fifth to the seventh. We kept adding the grades so that the kids wouldn't have to stop coming. And our numbers grew to 96. Uh, I just have a handful. I love this picture. Ruby is holding that snake like it. She just loves it. And then her sister Sassy next to her is delighted to be that close to a snake. Not a single kid, even when we're on the trails that we find the snake, is scared. They all will handle them. Girls, boys, both. They're playing a predator prey game. They're very enthusiastic about this. And they're looking at birds. So this year, we expanded again. Not only do we have all school corporations, but we also have some non-traditional <coughs> kids and, and homeschool kids, somebody from Monticello. We don't turn anybody away. We have three age groups, K through second, but we actually have four four-year-olds in that group. Third to fifth and sixth to eighth. We went to the eighth because the kids said, we don't want to stop coming. I've got kids that have been coming for four years now. And so we keep bumping it up so that they can keep doing that. We also have some of the older kids that come back and help with the kindergarten group. So they're, they're giving back. Uh, we currently have, at this point, this week, we have 130 kids registered in this program. And every time we have a meeting, we have more. So <laughs> at the beginning of the year, we do a thing also designed by Joseph Cornell called the Unnature Trail. And that's what they're doing over here on the inn. They're looking for these man-made items that I have placed within six feet of the trail. And I try to pick things that are man-made, but they don't look like it. I don't want to make it too easy. So they're trying to figure out, they have their list of what they're trying to find, and sometimes they don't find everything. Um, that's Jericho on the bottom. We were learning about monarchs. Rennie Winter came and, and presented her monarchs. She brought the big leaves, and they were fascinated with that. We also got to tag some and send them on their journey. We, we released Fred and Zonda, and that's what they named them, <laughs> into the wild. Floating on air, we had the atmospheric science guys come and show us how to make clouds. We did, the, we did uh, the Great Migration Challenge. Some of them died, but they had to do it dramatically. Then we had a presentation, and I didn't know that if you take water, a little bit of alcohol, rubbing alcohol in a bottle, and use a bicycle pump with a cork stop, you pump that up, get the pressure just right till where it pops, and it's really loud. Pops off, and you have a cloud. Who knew? I didn't know that. Uh, and they also did a thing where they microwave some ivory soap. That was kind of fun. The kids liked that one. So it, they really enjoyed, actually, the actual experimental part of it. As the world turns, this is our little group. This is our fastest growing group. We have, they, they, they really like uh, doing this. We went out in the woods. We were learning about the different leaves because they don't really know the names. I couldn't just say, find me an oak leaf and expect them to find it. I actually held it up so they could see as well as hear the name. And they were supposed to go through this obstacle course, get down to the bottom, pick out the leaf, go back, and then tag the person after them. They really enjoyed that. We took a walk in the woods and collected things that they thought were fascinating. And we made a crown for them to wear when they would go home. And they, I like their imagination. Batty about wild man. That's what we called the game this year. We played a game about bats. So some of the children here have bat masks on so they're blindfolded. And the other children were going beep, beep, beep and running around. And the whole thing was they had to catch them blind because they're using their radar to catch them. And then the, the parents kind of made the big circle. And this was his first attempt to go out and beat the wild man. This was the second group, and our beloved Mayor, Mayor Dennis, he came as Batman and to see what we were doing. So that's him way up there. <laughs> well, we told him we were learning about bats, and we actually had some, some um, preserved bats from the forestry department to show the children. So they're playing the same game where they're doing the beeping and they're blindfolded and stuff. And, and they're really running for the wild man, which is way back there at the back. And for this time, we let the oldest kids who've been playing for years, they were the wild man. 
Now for the big kids, they get the forestry guys. So <laughs> we might have to be challenging for them. The last one we had at the end of the year was Litter to Litter Everywhere. And this is a sad tale of Freddie the Fish. Laura, uh, my assistant, developed this one. All those things you see on the table are various forms of pollution. And there at the very beginning, you see how Freddie has nice clean water. Well, as Freddie goes down the downstream and she describes all the things that he comes across, we add that to the water. By the time you get down to the end, it looks like this. And the children were concerned. What happens to Freddie? And the littlest kids, we didn't really tell him that he died because that's the way the story goes. I'm sorry he died. So we just told him he was very, very sick. But they go, why can't he go back? So the, the children were worried about, well, we don't want this in our water. We don't want pollution. So it got them to thinking about how important it is to have clean water. So why do you think the children enjoy what we're doing so much? Well, we're introducing them to a wide range of environmental topics. But we're building relationships most of all. We are teaching them we love nature, and this is why, and we're sharing that love with them. In an ever-increasing world focused on technology and entertainment that is indoors, our children need this balance that comes from real-life experience outdoors. There's physically and mental uh, benefits to being outside in nature, and we see too much of the problems that are going on with our children today because they don't get that. We face some serious issues related to our planet and the environment, but our children are losing that connection to the world, and they will not fight for what they do not know or love. So we are introducing them to their world in a fun and hands-on way. <coughs> knowledge without love will not stick, but if love comes first, knowledge will surely follow. And that was John Burroughs 100 years ago. So we are the mentors that are helping the children develop that love, and we enjoy doing it. So a typical meeting goes, we have a topic of the day. We start with a game. Maybe they are a predator looking for prey. Maybe they are a tadpole trying not to get eaten by the fish. And maybe they are birds going on a migration and they must experience all the obstacles birds really face, including, I'm sorry you died. So then we go to a hands-on lesson. Sometimes they get to re meet real live animals. This next one we will have uh, Mark Booth, who ha is a falconer, and he will bring real live animals to share. This year we made the clouds with the atmospheric, Purdue Atmospheric Science Department. We hunt for bugs, track wildlife in the snow. We met monarch butterflies that help, and that we help tag and release for the long journey. And then we work on a craft, something they can take for them, make themselves, and take home to remember what we explored. And last of all, we have a treat. I tend to make homemade cupcakes and I base them on the theme of the day. So I get pretty wild with the decorations. I've made vultures, uh, frogs. Hmm. We made flowers this last time. I'll make owls the next time. Um, ducks, I've made ducks. So whatever, whatever we're doing, that's what they look like. And the kids kind of look forward to it too. So how do we know that we are succeeding? Well, we see it in the children themselves. We see their expression. We see their excitement. We have parents that bring all their children now, every children they have in their family, because we don't charge for any of this. It's all free to the children. <coughs> the parents have become our best source of advertisement as they tell their friends, you should take your kids to this program. And it's their excitement that tells us that we are doing the right thing, and we keep going. I have a staff of five to six girls from Forestry Department that have been helping me and I couldn't do it without them. I have a nice board, um, some of the professors at Purdue, we have a teacher, a retired teacher, and then Laura and I, and so I think we have a good group. This is actually at Klondike Elementary, and they're doing the same on Nature Trail. Jorge has found the squirrel up in the, in the tree. There's a rubber ducky over here, and so they're excited to find whatever they can find. Oh, we're doing that again. Living Schoolyards is a program we started just this year. Last year, Laura and I went down to Austin, Texas to the first <coughs> ever Children and Nature Network Conference. <coughs> Richard Louv is the one that started that, that wrote the book, Last Child in the Woods. There were 400 people from all over the world at that conference. 
and we all talked about the problem of connecting children to nature. And one of the things they encouraged us, everybody who was there, was that we need to go where the children are. It is that critically important to reach the children. So on the way back, as we were taking turns driving, we formulated the idea of living <coughs> schoolyards. We actually go to the schools themselves, work with the children and the teachers to develop a pocket of nature on their school grounds. They determine what that vision is, what it is that they're trying to do, and we help them do it. At Klondike Elementary, we are creating a butterfly garden in their inner courtyard. We have eight classrooms of first graders, about 185 children that are doing the work there. At James Cole Elementary, we have two classrooms of fifth graders, about 37 children, and they're a little older, so they're actually doing more of the actual designing and decisions and uh, they're making a children's garden in an area about 66 feet wide and 240 feet long. Happy Hollow Elementary recently joined us. They have five classrooms of fifth and sixth graders, about 125 children, and they're trying to make an outdoor classroom that is wildlife friendly. They had gotten a grant a couple of years ago, and they need to spend it by May, and they had wonderful ideas but didn't know how to actually do it. So that's where we came in. They knew from the presentation we had in February that we know how to put the ideas to action. And that's what we did. So we're doing that. We want to empower them with love of their world and a knowledge that they can make a difference. At the beginning of the year of the survey of the first graders, about half of them felt they could make no difference in their environment. By the end of this year, they will know they can make a difference as they attract all those butterflies to their area. This is at Klondike Elementary. At the top left is what it looked like in the beginning. We're putting in a patio right there, and it'll be surrounded by uh, several layers of sunflowers. There'll be tables in there um, with, with stumps for chairs. This is the hungry, hungry caterpillar. We cleaned up that, and now we have, of course, we have Gerald the giraffe. But the children painted bricks that are edging. We have an outdoor classroom. The children already started their flowers, which are germinating. I made a video for them this morning to see how their flowers are coming along. And they will plant some of every species that's supposed to be good for butterflies in their garden. And they will do that work just here, like, Friday. Tomorrow. We're starting Friday. So our goals for the future is to reach as many children in this county as possible. We will continue to hold Junior Nature Club. We will expand meetings as necessary to keep our size below 50. So if we have to add extra nights to meet the need, we will do that. We hope to add two or three more schools to the Living Schoolyard program this fall. And we would like to eventually have programs in all 23 elementary schools, but that will take time, staff, and funding at that point. <coughs> we will uh, continue to recruit interns and staff from Purdue University and our community, because this is really a big job. We've been applying for grants like crazy. I'm about ready to submit one to the EPA for environmental ed. So we, we know this job needs to be done, and, and somebody has to do it. We talk about it, but somebody has to do it, and that's what we're doing. We're saying, okay, we will do it. Um, we feel like there's so much at stake preparing the next generation to care for our earth, and we feel the children are certainly worth it. We've come to form a lot of bonds with them, and we, we truly do love them. So thank you. Any questions? back in business with our guest speaker gift. So this is to thank you, thank you. for your time in, in presenting that to our, our group. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to Terry. I know who's speaking next week is Brooke Criswell, who's the Education and Outreach Coordinator of Niches Land Trust. That will discuss her organization the organization that she works for and the properties available for everyone in the county. Thank you.